On this couch, something extraordinary happened. Nothing less than a revolution in the human mind. The couch really embodies the whole self-consciousness that has been one of the hallmarks of the 20th century, the ability to analyze ourselves, think about ourselves, the whole culture of therapy which flourished in the last century. Here, a series of neurotic Viennese patients lay somewhere between dream and waking, describing their symptoms to one of the most famous thinkers of the 20th century. It was a kind of experimental instrument for dreaming. Um, and it became really for its patients a kind of magic carpet on which they could move across time as well as space into the past. Beside this couch sat Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis. For 50 years, Freud's patients were on the couch, putting their dreams and anxieties into words. This is a place every student of psychology learns about. He sat them on the couch and um, well, then he made them relax, lie down and relax so that they were in a relaxed setting and they could discuss things like verbally and they could be more open with themselves if they were relaxed. The patients on this couch gave us the Freudian slip and the Oedipus complex. Freud's couch has come to symbolize all that is weird, wonderful or repulsive in the human mind. It has had narrow escapes from danger and has been driven into exile along with its owner. Today, in its London home, the couch is admired by pilgrims from around the world. Twenty Maresfield Gardens, Hampstead, is the couch's final resting place. It arrived here in 1938, after being crated up and dispatched from Vienna. The couch occupies the pride of place in the room where its owner spent the last year of his life. Long after the death of Freud, the couch remains the key symbol of psychoanalysis, an invitation to reveal everything. It looks so inviting, so comfortable, you'd immediately want to lie down and dredge out all your thoughts about the past. You feel you couldn't even stop them pouring out. The couch stands in for therapy, it stands in for psychoanalysis. It's an iconic image, it's been oh, in hundreds of, of cartoons, hundreds of jokes, it's, it's everywhere. Being on the couch means telling the unvarnished truth, revealing your most embarrassing fears and secrets. I'm just getting now, really fed. Do the bit about a last poor Yorick. No, I'm sick of it. I want to do something else. I want to make something of my life. No, I don't know that bit. I want to get away from all that. Be different. Well, um, what do you want to be? A private dick. <laughs> private dick? Yes, a private dick. The Couch's illustrious career began in 1891, when it met a young Viennese neurologist, Dr. Sigmund Freud. Vienna was the capital of the polyglot Austro-Hungarian Empire. Eleven different nationalities argued with each other in eleven different languages. Interest in women and sex was a top priority for Viennese writers and intellectuals. Freud's Couch would not have a quiet life. At that time, a couch was a normal part of every Viennese doctor's consulting room. These couches were adjustable so that patients could be examined in different ways. It was a piece of furniture which you could find in almost all practice rooms of physicians. And as Freud started, his career as a physician, uh, it's a kind of souvenir of his uh, medical background. In 1891, one of Freud's patients, Madame Benvenisti, staked her claim to immortality when she gave Freud a new couch. His own common examination bed was, as far as she was concerned, rather uncomfortable. And she thought he could do better. <laughs> <laughs> by having this more domestic object and more comfortable place to sit on and lie on. Freud's couch is usually buried under piles of cushions and oriental carpets. 
So if we undress the couch, what exactly lies beneath? Freud's couch is not the type of couch you would have seen in a doctor's surgery or for medical use. Medical couches were adjustable, adjustable heads, adjustable feet, uh, you could raise and lower the seat. But Freud's couch is quite distinctive in design. It's much more like a piece of domestic furniture which he's adapted for use in his consulting room. The style that dominated Austrian domestic furniture in the mid-19th century was known as Biedermeier. Freud's couch is typical of pieces inspired by Biedermeier furniture with this rectangular form of the seat and the classically inspired bolster at the end and the rectangular blocks underneath. And Biedermeier furniture was all about clean lines and rectangular forms inspired by classical design. The domestic couch was a piece of furniture that suggested the intimacy of a lady's bedroom. In polite society, ladies were not seen publicly reclining on couches. Couches like this were uh, very much used by women, particularly actually in bedrooms uh, during the lying-in period after childbirth, um, when the, w the new mother would receive guests lying on the couch. It wouldn't have been common to see women reclining on couches like this in social situations uh, because, of course, they were used in private rooms, in bedrooms, in boudoirs, and occasionally in sitting rooms. The couch was to become the focal point of Freud's practice, appropriate for a doctor who never saw any blood. If we think of Freud and his science as a medical science, which some people don't, uh, but if we think of it in that way, it, it, it's something which is halfway between the rather surgical examination table, cold, clinical, upright, hard to lie on, where the patient may feel indeed that she, he is about to be opened for inspection. So it's halfway between that and the kind of boudoir, uh, chaise longue, in which um, the woman reclines when she's feeling a little tired, a little melancholy perhaps. Patients were lured onto the couch because in keeping with the fashion of the time, it was covered with a beautiful Persian carpet. This couch was reassuringly bourgeois. Certainly anyone who saw that couch would have no fears that somebody with fleas and an unwashed person would be lying there agonizing over his thoughts. No, it was something for the well-to-do. With the rugs on, it looks quite a luxurious piece of equipment. And in a way, that was the purpose of it, was to inspire confidence. A young practitioner had to uh, inspire confidence in his potential clients. The rug we see on Freud's couch was a kashkai, woven by women from a nomadic tribe in southern Iran. Vienna was a major centre for trading in carpets from the east, and these exotic textiles conjured up Orientalist visions. All Persian, all Oriental rugs are a whole set of symbols. They're, they're schematic landscapes, actions. So uh, there's that other level where you can use them like Rorschach ink plots, that you look at them and you, and you dream something into them or out of them. It has emblems of plants, it also has female emblems in it, and probably behind the plants and these female symbols is the idea of fertility. So, um, again, this comes back to luxury, to riches, to success. The couch felt luxurious, but even when Freud embarked upon his psychoanalytic project at the turn of the century, it looked curiously old-fashioned. All over Vienna, doctors were switching to more modern antiseptic examination couches. Freud started as a doctor at a time when there were no hygienic concerns about bacteria which could live in the carpets and in the couches. And only 20 years later, at the turn of the century, a new form of furnishing uh, doctor's rooms uh, began, but as Freud worked in a completely different uh, way or in a different direction, he kept this old form of furniture, so it's a relic or a souvenir of early uh, medical furnishing.
Many of the first patients to lie down on Freud's couch were surrendering to hypnotism. It was a technique for exploring the mind that Freud had studied in Paris. But there were problems with hypnotism. When patients surfaced from their trance, they couldn't remember anything. And Freud discovered he wasn't much good at hypnosis. Freud famously said the day when a patient said, I'm not, I'm not asleep. This is the moment when he realized that trying to bully patients into a hypnotic state was not what he was good at and wasn't necessary. Because all he had to do was get them into a certain state of psychic relaxation and then he could work with the material that flowed from that. The couch enabled Freud to take a new approach to neurotic and hysterical symptoms. Psychoanalysis. People talking about their everyday lives. I think for Freud, the idea of the couch might have been partially accidental, but also it allowed him to introduce into his practice the whole notion of domesticity. What is Freud about but about our intimate everyday lives? He isn't about the great or the man of action or politics or history in that sense. He is about the tales women gossip about. He is about what we tell each other around the kitchen table. In 1892, the couch welcomed Fräulein Elisabeth von R, one of the earliest and most important case studies in psychoanalysis. She was a 24-year-old woman who was experiencing excruciating pains in her legs, at times adding up to a state of paralysis after nursing her father through a long illness. Freud elicited from Elisabeth von R a story of how her dying father had pressed down on her leg when she had changed his dressing and also a story of how she had fallen in love with her sister's husband, a love that had given rise to feelings of terrible guilt. Freud tells us that as Elizabeth von R connected her memories with her physical symptoms, she got better. The act of lying on the couch and speaking about difficult experiences had become the talking cure of psychoanalysis. The marvellous thing about the couch, the reason that it has stayed with us all these years, is because it contains within it what is the essence of psychoanalysis. Human consciousness is an immensely powerful organ or system. When you bring human consciousness to bear on any aspect of your life, suddenly you get the power to sort it out, to reconstruct it in a way that's less damaging. Freud's couch became the basis for a new approach to the human mind. When Freud wrote up the case of Elizabeth von R, he noted that it was similar to a work of fiction. Freud does say, I'm really, really sorry that this story is, if you like, a little like a couch. It's just a little domestic novelette. It's just a little tale of love. It's just a little, you know, flurry. But in fact, it is also a case history. It is also science. It is also the way in which we understand the human mind. Men and women suffering from hysterical and neurotic symptoms were drawn to Freud's couch to talk about their problems. There was something about lying on a couch that opened people up, as generations of patients have discovered since. I think we do embody our emotions a lot, and when you're in that position, which is quite childlike, uh, and actually in a way quite uh, vulnerable, you can go one of two ways, you can be either very defensive or actually you can open up um, if you trust your therapist. And in fact, one's vulnerability, in my case, my vulnerability actually enabled me to, to speak more freely. Like Alice in Wonderland, patients find themselves falling down a rabbit hole, descending into a vortex of memories, dreams and free associations. Losing the control over one's mind or one's thoughts is one of the basic principles of psychoanalysis, of saying all the things which come to your mind without any censorship or without any control is one of the idealistic basic principles of psychoanalysis. The couch was positioned against the wall of the consulting room. At one end was a chair where Freud would sit, 
unseen by the patient. Freud thought his seating plan was important, and he explained why in a famous essay. I hold to the plan of getting the patient to lie on a sofa while I sit behind him out of sight. This arrangement has a historical basis. It is the remnant of the hypnotic method out of which psychoanalysis was evolved. But it deserves to be maintained for many reasons. For one thing, I cannot put up with being stared at by other people for eight hours a day or more. The second reason was even more important. Freud didn't want his patients to see his face. I do not wish my facial expressions to give the patient material for interpretation or to influence him in what he tells me. When you lie on the couch and you do not see the person you're talking to, you turn inward and your history, your own history, unfolds in front of your eyes and you can narrate it at the same time as you're turning inwards and looking at your own life pieces of your own history start making sense and you become more meaningful to yourself as a person. Talking to an invisible listener can be a liberating experience. It can also be deeply disturbing. Because you can't see the analyst when you're on the couch because he sits behind you, um, you have all sorts of fantasies. You, and in analysis, the therapist doesn't say very much. They speak maybe two or three times in 50 minutes. So in those silences, of course, you wonder whether your therapist is still there, whether he is naked, whether he has set himself on fire, whether he's left the room and gone for a quick burger. You don't know what he's doing. Had the couch been animate, it would have recoiled in horror at the arrival of a man whom Freud called the Wolf Man. His real name was Sergei Pankajev. He was a Russian aristocrat, and he was in a bad way. He hadn't been to the toilet in the normal way for five years. He could only move his bowels with an enema. His father and his sister had both committed suicide, and he felt as if there was a veil cutting him off from reality. This famous patient spent four years in analysis with Freud. Four years on the couch, six days a week, that's a lot of words to be listening to. And out of those words, you have to extract the, the kind of basic skeleton, not only of a life, but of the, an illness and the history of that illness. The wolf man remembered a childhood dream which Freud believed was the key to his neurosis. I dreamt that it was night and that I was lying in bed. Suddenly the window opened of its own accord and I was terrified to see that some white wolves were sitting on the big walnut tree in front of the window. There were six or seven of them. They had big tails like foxes and they had their ears pricked like dogs when they pay attention to something. In great terror evidently of being eaten by the wolves, I screamed and woke up. Freud takes this dream to be extremely important because it was a dream the boy had the night of his fourth birthday. And from that moment on, he woke up in terror, his character changed completely. So the dream itself, in a sense, is the trauma that transformed his life. But it's a senseless trauma because why would a dream be so dramatic? Freud looks back to early experiences and reconstructs a scene of the little boy at age one and a half, probably, watching his parents copulate on a hot sun, summer's afternoon. So that the wolves in the tree become the parents copulating and his interrupting of the parents copulating. The wolf man was so grateful for this interpretation that he made a painting of his dream which he presented to Freud. Later, critics would question whether the Wolfman's dream really meant what Freud claimed, a traumatic early glimpse of his parents having sex. But Freud believed he had embarked on a great project. His technique of psychoanalysis on the couch would give him access to the most deeply buried material in his patient's mind. As word of the couch spread, and the extraordinary experiences of those who lay on it, 
Patients made the pilgrimage to Freud's consulting room. After the First World War, wealthy American and British patients visited Vienna to undertake psychoanalysis. Freud wrote, I developed a technique to eliminate psychic material in layers, which I like to compare to the technique of unearthing a buried city. To the patient, Freud explained what he wanted to get out of them by pointing to the collection of antique objects surrounding the couch. He thought that the patient lying on the couch was like the whole history of human beings lying there and that you could reach back into their unconscious and find the primeval, the Egyptian. And he might well point to a, a god or goddess sitting on, on his desk and say, you know, the, these are like the contents of your mind. They are from long ago, but they are still with us. The violence of primitive political forces erupted into Freud's world in March 1938, when Nazi Germany annexed Austria. As part of their campaign of virulent hatred of Jews and their culture, the Nazis denounced psychoanalysis as Jewish science. With Hitler welcomed to Vienna by cheering crowds and swastikas decorating the facade of Freud's apartment, it was time for the couch to leave. Ernest Jones, a clever, well-connected Welsh doctor, had been a key player in the psychoanalytic movement for 30 years. Now he came to the rescue. At the ice skating rink, Jones bonded with the man who held the key to giving Freud a visa to escape Austria, the Home Secretary, Sir Samuel Hoare. Jones was a fixer, so whatever environment he was in, he milked it for his own advantage. So there's no question when he was a schoolboy at Llandovery, he used to skate up and down the, the river in, 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 in the winter. So it was, it, he didn't do it only for social climbing, so to speak, but he saw the social value of it when he was in London. Jones explained that Freud was in serious danger in Austria and talked Sir Samuel Hoare into handing out enough visas to allow Freud, plus family, to depart for London. Freud left his couch behind in Vienna. A Nazi commissar, Dr. Anton Sauerwald, was given responsibility for administering the case of Professor Sigmund Freud, and Sauerwald was the one who arranged to send Freud's goods to London. The venerable couch, was crated up and manoeuvred down the stairs of the Beg Gasser apartment, where it had lived for 47 years. At the Westbahnhof, it was packed aboard one of the trains transporting the belongings of the Jews of Vienna into exile. Obviously, the couch had significance. This is the couch on which he devolved his whole practice. It is the key item of furniture, I would think. The couch crossed the English Channel safely. Freud received this letter from the Viennese removal firm, informing him that on the 28th of July 1938, three wagons were sent to the firm of Woodbridge Removal and Oversea Limited, Fenchurch Street, London. The firm delivered Freud's possessions to him in Hampstead. While all his possessions, his, his documents and books, and of course the couch too, were in the Nazis' hands. He felt he was in some sense still a victim of them. He says, only when these things are back in my possession will I be Nazi frei, free of the Nazis. In the couch's new home in Mersfield Gardens, the furniture was carefully arranged by Freud's daughter Anna and Paula the maid, just as it was in Vienna, but with everything easily accessible on the ground floor. By this time, Sigmund Freud was 82 years old and terminally ill with cancer of the jaw. Yet in Hampstead, he still insisted on taking four new patients onto his couch. He had a large family. Some of his children couldn't find work at that point, so he had to make money. So he set up practice here in the study with the couch again only four patients which was of course nothing to what he used to do he would do that in a morning in the old days
Freud died in September 1939, a few days after the start of World War II. The fame of the couch continued to spread around the world, symbolizing the idea that in psychoanalysis, every problem is linked to sex. Why does anyone want to be a private dick? Fame, money, glamour, excitement, sex. Ah, oh, it's the sex, is it? Well, that's one of the things, yes. Now, what's the sex problem? Well, there's no problem. Now, come on, come on. You've got this girl on the bed, and she's all ready for well, it. No, it's nothing to do with that. No, no, come on, come on. There she is, she's all ready for it. She's a real stunner. She's got great big tits. She's really well stacked. And, and you've got her legs up against the mantelpiece. All right, Mr. And she... I'll take her, man. Today, 20 Maresfield Gardens is open to the public as the Freud Museum. Visitors from all over the world make the pilgrimage to see the couch. For many, it's an emotional experience. Well, some people do react a bit too emotionally when they see the couch and want to hurl themselves onto it and set the alarms off. <laughs> That's, uh, that has happened several times. Um, and some uh, just stand here in silent contemplation, sometimes with tears rolling down their cheeks. From one couch in Vienna has come a movement that disrupted the sexual values of society and presented some shocking ideas for inspection. These days, critical voices are questioning the value of Freud's case studies, arguing that they have no scientific basis and the couch never revealed the truth about the human mind. You lie there and burden your thoughts, uh, and so what? I mean, to call this a cure of, 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 of depression or one of the things that go wrong in people's lives, many people who don't think psychoanalysis is any healing form of therapy, would, I think, think the culture was just a false promise, a kind of happy return to infancy where everything is all right and somebody will look after you and all is comfort. Like psychoanalysis, the couch has taken a battering and is clearly sagging under the weight of all those well-fed bourgeois patients. The pad is stuffed with horsehair, and you can hear it slightly creaking as I press it. And the, that is fixed to the wooden frame that you can see where the top cover material has worn away. It's actually slightly dented here, I think, because this is the point at which they would probably swing their legs over the edge to get off. So the maximum weight would be on that edge. The couch may be showing its age, yet it remains an extraordinary relic of a revolution that challenged our understanding of the human mind. It <laughs> could do with a little refurbishing, and maybe that's true of psychoanalysis as well, I don't know. But it, but it still feels extraordinary because you, you do have the sense of um, the people who have been there and, and the, the, the narratives and the thought that was woven around their lives and indeed around our individual lives and the way in which we all still see ourselves. We still think that our childhood has created the adults that we are. We still give significance to the inner narrative of our lives and I don't think that was quite the case in the same way before the couch came into being and Freud who used it so well. And there's another masterpiece here on BBC4 tomorrow at half past seven.